Hello, everyone. This 2015 Virtual Education Summit Ask the Docs webinar. This is where you can ask the doctors questions related to the pre-recorded videos for the summit, the ones that you should have watched earlier. Uh, my name is Jim Mundy, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Here's our panel of doctors. We have Dr. Ken Chapman from Toronto Western Hospital in Toronto. We also have Dr. Marcia Spivak from Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. And we have Dr. Robert Sandhouse from Jewish National Health in Denver, Colorado. I want to start by asking uh, each of the panelists just to spend a minute or two introducing themselves, and tell us a bit about your background, and then we'll get on to the questions. So let's start with Dr. Chapman. Dr. Chapman? Hello, I'm uh, a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and I'm based at what's grandly called the University Health Network and I think of it as the simple little Toronto Western Hospital at the corner of Bathurst and Dundas. I um, have uh, been in charge of the Alpha One registry in Canada for uh, a little over 15 years and in that time I've had the opportunity to uh, uh, see a number of patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and to take part in a number of very useful studies finding out about how um, patients in Canada are faring, that's why we maintain the registry, uh, taking part in the uh, very important and recently published RAPID trial um, and a number of other studies. Along the way I've been learning quite a bit about alpha-1 and uh, um, I'm quite excited by the opportunity to uh, share a bit of that through Alpha One Canada. They've been doing a great job of getting the word out and uh, this uh, program is uh, just one more example of that. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, Dr. Spivak? Well, hi. Um, I am not a medical doctor. I have a PhD in genetics. Uh, I work at uh, Trillium Health Partners, which is uh, in Mississauga, outside of uh, the greater Toronto area. Um, our lab there is a, it, it's kind of a multi-purpose with all sorts of genetic issues amongst the uh, population in, in our area. Um, and what one of the many tests that we do is for the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, and um, it's it's been a, about 12 to 14 years since we first started testing for alpha-1 and uh, over time um, uh, a lot has changed and we, we've been able to go from just testing for the uh, common mutations to uh, absolutely every uh, possible mutation deficiency. So it's an exciting time in genetics um, we're finding also that through uh, knowledge of the genes, uh, there are opportunities for um, therapy, and that's uh, not just for alpha-1, but for many other genetic diseases. So it is a very interesting time to um, be in genetics, and uh, I hope I have, can uh, answer some of your questions today. Thank you, Dr. Spivak. Um, I guess I don't know if I'm the only one who noticed we're having a little bit of technical problem, but um, hopefully we'll get that fixed up. I just want to um, uh, move on and uh, Dr. Sandhouse, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Dr. Sandy Sandhouse and uh, I'm a professor of medicine at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado, a respiratory and uh, immune disease uh, facility that's uh, uh, been around for over a century, and I've been around for over a century too at that institution. Um, and I also am the medical director of uh, the Alpha One Foundation and uh, AlphaMet in the United States, which now has uh, a branch in uh, Canada or a freestanding uh, organization in Canada, it's AlphaMet Canada, that uh, uh, does disease management on patients who are receiving augmentation therapy for Alpha One. Um, and I was uh, uh, asked uh, to do the uh, session on uh, stem cells, uh, both the good and the bad uh, of stem cell therapy. Um, and uh, I was very pleased to do that, and I hope that uh, people have enjoyed uh, listening to it. 
Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, okay, so our Q&A session is now going to start. Um, attendees, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, you know, well, by pushing the raise your hand button, that is. Um, and um, Or you can type your questions into a chat pane here. I've got a couple of emails that people have sent me. They, they weren't able to come with some questions, so I'll try to fill in uh, uh, where, where I can. So, Um, I'll start with uh, with this question uh, for Dr. Sandhouse. Would would stem? I'm sorry, I'm just reading from the chat screen. Would stem cell therapy be more certain to work if the immune system were brought to its highest fighting power, like IVIG treatment? And do your alpha patients receive augmentation therapy along with IVIG to hold their immune system in better standing? So um, one of the advantages or potential advantages of stem cell therapy is that um, there is not an interaction of your own stem cells uh, with your immune system because the, uh, uh, your immune system would recognize those stem cells as, uh, as being of, of your own uh, making if you're using adult stem cells that were derived from you, for instance. Um, and stem cells that are uh, of embryonic origin, you know, that come, that are derived from uh, embryos, um, are usually derived, uh, are usually cells that the body doesn't recognize as foreign either. So that's not exactly what you're getting at, I think, with the with the question that was that was asked. Um, we do have some patients on both augmentation therapy and IV immunoglobulin therapy. But that's because they have both alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and an immunodeficiency. And so they're both being treated separately by two plasma-derived IV medications. I, in, in my practice and in the patients we follow, we don't consider that beefing up someone's immune system, if you will, by using IVIG is necessarily a, a uh, positive treatment for alpha-1 patients. And remember, I think a lot of patients get confused by mixing up the inflammatory system and the immune system, even though they're closely related. You know, al alpha-1 is pretty much an anti-inflammatory agent, not an anti-immune or a pro-immune agent. And so um, the fact that, for instance, people get infections with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency-related lung disease is more related to the fact that they have COPD, which is characterized by getting infections, and not some um, falling down of the immune system. And, I, you know, others may, I, I think Ken and, uh, would probably be able to comment better from the Canadian perspective in that, in that regard. Um, and, and he also might have a different perspective than I do on that. Dr. Chapman, did, did you want to add anything? No, I'd, I'd agree. I think that um, Sandy has outlined it clearly. The concept of stem cell therapy is receiving a treatment from your own stem cells. So it's not a question of having to adjust the immunity up or down. Um, there is a separate question about immune status, um, but as Sandy has said, um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency isn't specifically associated with any sort of immunodeficiency. Mind you, I think as we struggle to deal with COPD in general and tough alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in general, one of the things we might check from time to time is for immunodeficiencies. And occasionally somebody has the bad luck to have double barrel disease. Fortunately, that's not too common. And um, it does seem to be just a, a rare bad luck story. Thank you. Um, this question is for Dr. Chapman. Is there a simple way for me to suggest to my doctor that since I have flare-ups only once every couple of years, that maybe I don't need to be on inhaled steroids? Um, it's always a delicate thing to um, uh, negotiate with one's physician, but um, maybe this background will help. Um, inhaled steroids have um, a very prominent role in asthma. 
um, their essential or, or foundational therapy. But for a long time, we tried to understand whether inhaled steroids had any role at all in the management of COPD. And eventually, we concluded that they might just do a little bit to reduce exacerbations, flare-ups. Um, somehow, there were um, a handful of very um, um, widely quoted studies uh, in the mid-2000s, 2007, 2008, that talked about the impact of inhaled steroids as part of a treatment in COPD. And pretty soon, it became common across North America and many parts of the world uh, to include inhaled steroids routinely. And I think as the questioners implied, not everybody needs those inhaled steroids. Moreover, we also recognize that inhaled steroids come at a bit of a cost, not just the financial cost, but uh, that they do increase the risk of sinus infections, pneumonia, um, reactivation, tuberculosis, and so on. So what do you do? You say to yourself, well, I've been reading all of this carefully. I'm not having many flare-ups. not sure I need these inhaled steroids. Um, I'd suggest you um, tell your doctor what you've been hearing, that inhaled steroids have never been foundational in COPD and uh, that um, maybe they're more and more being reserved for the exacerbation-prone patient. Do you think that you could get along with a lower dose of inhaled steroid or, or perhaps no inhaled steroid at all. Uh, in Canada, that might be helped also by pointing out that um, there are some new and very effective inhaled bronchodilator combinations um, to focus on, um, and they would definitely put the inhaled steroids in second place or as a backup therapy. Um, share it with your doctor. Now, the questioner hasn't said specifically, is this a family doctor or um, uh, a respirologist, a pulmonologist? Um, and the negotiation's perhaps a little bit different. Um, but I would hope if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that a respirologist is part of your care and the um, respiratory specialist should be very familiar with these thoughts and arguments. Um, there's an ultimate uh, fallback, of course, if, if you're not getting um, your question closely considered and responded to, uh, you could always ask for and seek a second opinion. But I think if you approach it um, 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 uh, in, a, in, a, in a polite way and suggest that maybe uh, the pattern of few exacerbations is quite clear to you, your doctor will, uh, will come on board. Thank you. Um, this one's for Dr. Spivak. Well, this, guy, this person's been doing their homework. I read quite recently that some deficient genes can cause worse versions of alpha-1 than others. I think they mentioned Malton. Are there others? Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, there, there are dozens of mutations. Um, most people would have the, the common mutation, either known as Z or S. But Malton is uh, one of the more rare mutations. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I can't tell you all their names. They're, they're uh, very, uh, as I mentioned in, in the lecture, they're often named after the city where either the patient lived or the, the doctor who discovered the mutation lived. So um, over time, um, those, those names kind of become meaningless and we try nowadays to name the mutations exactly for what they are which is a um, just a, a change in an amino acid usually uh, and there are some that are worse than others but um, overall you can basically tell how bad they are by uh, looking at the enzyme activity which is a biochemical test and uh, I think that the biochemists can tell very easily uh, how bad a mutation is by, um, or how, uh, because there's often two mutations that the individual has uh, by the uh, activity in their serum. But so what we do uh, in the molecular lab is just confirm what has already been suspected by the um, by the uh, lung specialist or biochemist. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Am I correct that Advair is not a steroid? That's, um, if I jump in, that's incorrect. Uh, Advair is a combination inhaler. It includes a steroid and it includes an airway opener. Does, I guess this is for Dr. Chapman, it's about ACOS. Does being on prolastin help someone with ACOS more than someone with regular COPD or less or does it matter? I guess the honest answer is we don't know. Um, the um, general features of ACOS that I offered in the presentation are people with ACOS seem to have more symptoms um, and they seem to have more flare-ups. And if that means the potential for more ongoing alpha-1 damage, I suppose you could theorize that the prolastin would be more helpful or more protective in a bad situation. But at the end of the day, ACOS is something that we've only recently named and tried to define, and we don't have many long-term studies of ACOS in regular COPD, and we certainly don't have long-term studies in alpha. So it's all pretty speculative at this point. Um, I think we're still learning about prolastin and uh, augmentation therapy in general, how best to give it. The last question that Dr. Spivak uh, answered raises the question of whether we should be using slightly different doses of augmentation therapy depending upon what your background deficiency type is. And that's something that's not uh, part of the product monograph or part of current uh, practice, but it's certainly something that we may get to in time. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Santos, I guess, it, I, this is person's referring to um, the stem cells you talk about in your presentation. It says, if these stem cells are exposed to so many cocktails and agents along the way, how do you know they're not, how do you know they are going to end up as normal? That's a great question. Um, I think that uh, the uh, honest answer is that we're not really sure yet, and that's why um, some of the uh, uh, stem cell research that furthest along um, is still hesitant uh, to, to take those cells and give them back to humans. As I kind of uh, mentioned in the, in the talk, one of the things that we do know, and it's unclear if this is related to these cocktails that are used to mature cells from stem cells into a particular cell type, or if it's simply passage in culture over time uh, where the cells are dividing and dividing and dividing, is that these cells tend to pick up identifiable mutations in the genes, with, and the longer the stem cells are grown in culture, the more mutations are picked up. And that's either just from culturing or it's from culturing plus the effects of these cocktails that are used to first make stem cells from, uh, from more mature cells and then to take those stem cells and mature them into the cell type that you want. Um, so th the answer is not yet in. Um, what has to be done to uh, first document that a stem cell that's been matured, say, into a liver cell or a group of lung cells um, to document that those cells are safely normal cells and to document that they're not going to do something strange at the other end. The, the reassuring part is that the animal work that's been done to take those cells and put them back into animals um, uh, they, has been promising. And one of the uh, things that makes that promising is if you take a stem cell and you put it into a liver, for example, of an animal, the liver itself can mature that cell into the cell type of that, uh, of that organ. And that is done without cocktails and things like that. So the, the good news is that the body is very good at maturing stem cells. That's how we became what we are from being embryos. And uh, so we might have to use less and less of that as cocktails. And, and, and put the cells in the right and normal environment and, and uh, have it become the cell we want it to be uh, without having to use as many cocktails, if you will, as many chemicals and hormones and growing conditions as we have been doing to learn more about stem cells in the lab. Long answer to a, to a very good question.
Thank you. Uh, if you require oxygen, is it safe to fly? I'm sure either Ken or I can uh, can start on this. The uh, um, what it depends on what you mean by safe. And if you require oxygen, in general, in general, you will require oxygen when you fly because the effect of altitude inside of a plane uh, is six to eight thousand feet, and we all know that the uh, uh, amount of oxygen in the air you breathe at higher altitudes, like Denver, um, uh, is less than at sea level, or the partial pressure of oxygen, as it's called, uh, is less uh, at higher altitudes than at sea level. And so someone will generally need, at, who's, who's using oxygen at rest, someone is likely to need more oxygen um, when they're in an airplane. Um, and people who have lung disease and don't need oxygen at sea level may need oxygen when they fly. So the answer from my standpoint is it can be made safe to fly for someone who needs oxygen, um, but that has to be done by either predicting what amount of oxygen someone's going to need is going to be, or by having someone wear an oximeter on the plane and use the oxygen that they need, which means taking nowadays an oxygen concentrator, a portable oxygen concentrator on the plane with them. I'll turn it over to Ken and see if there's anything else. Yeah. That's a, a, a very good answer, and I'll just add, if um, you're not using oxygen on the ground, but there is a question of whether you might need it in the air, another approach that some labs will do, our lab does it, is to do an altitude simulation. So you'd sit for 20 minutes breathing in uh, slightly reduced um, oxygen concentrations equivalent to uh, what they might be on an airline. And uh, if your blood oxygen level drops, we know that you will need oxygen on the flight. Um, that's not a widely available test, but um, it may be available to you. Ask your pulmonologist, respirologist. Okay, thank you. Um, should all alpha patients take amino acids on a daily basis, especially if they're on IV therapy? I guess prolastin. I'll jump in. I mean, there's really no reason to take uh, supplements of amino acids um, if you're if you're on a well balanced diet, um, uh, your body gets the amino acids that it needs um, from the proteins that you eat, and there are many uh, simple amino acids that can be that are actually synthesized in the body or by bacteria in the gut. Um, and so, unless someone has a specific dietary deficiency, I don't think that there's any particular need to take amino acids because they're on augmentation therapy, which is made up of several grams of protein, um, which contains lots of amino acids there as well. Ken, do you want to add anything? No, I agree. Um, no particular dietary supplements that we know of for patients with alpha. Okay, I've been taking Advair daily as an anti-inflammatory. Is there something else that would be preferable? I have very few flare-ups, but generally have a chronic dry cough. That's, that may be a little too specific, but um, without any other medical background, but I don't know, Sandy, Ken? Um, I think that um, in an earlier question, we talked a bit about the um, role of inhaled steroids, which is to reduce flare-ups, and it's a very small role. And if you're not having many flare-ups, you could ask your prescribing doctor if you need inhaled steroids at all or if you need as much as you're taking. Uh, it's possible you could enjoy a dosage reduction. Um, another possibility is to um, shift sideways a little bit and take an inhaled treatment that focuses a bit more on the airway opening part, the bronchodilator part. Uh, we have a couple of once daily combination bronchodilators now in Canada. Uh, the brand names in alphabetical order, just to play fair here, would be Anoro and Ultagro, and those would do a once daily job of opening up the airways, and separately, if you needed it, you could take an inhaled steroid. So I think you should always be 
looking at what you're taking, looking for the edge, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable question to take to your doctor. Um, and uh, uh, it's um, uh, even if you stuck with the same inhaler that you're familiar with, the Advair inhaler, it comes in several strengths. So you could even talk about adjusting the strength to a, a milder strength if you don't think you need the dosage you're getting. Okay, thank you. Well, here's somebody with a little bit of sense of humor. Is it, po is it possible, I, this is for Dr. Spivak, is it possible over time for alpha-1 to no longer be found in a family if we all marry enough MMs? I would say that there is absolutely no reason to start deciding on who you're going to marry based on your genotype. And yet, I mean, that's my opinion, and yet there is a... Um, there is a, uh, and a, this isn't an advertisement at all, but there is a company that now offers uh, genotyping uh, for several hundred genetic diseases to test you for a recessive disorder, and that you could use this for family planning or for who, who you're going to marry. Um, to see if you've got you're genetically compatible, and this is actually out there right now. So, this is where things may be going. Not that I um, think it's. Uh, I mean, when we look at it, if 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 the carrier, um, the frequency of being a carrier for alpha one deficiency is around. I I don't know. I think it's around one in forty. Up. Oh to marry another carrier, and that would be a 1 in 16 of 1,600 chance of doing that. And then the chance of having an affected child is, um, is, is that is, uh, divide that chance by 4, so, because there's a 1 in 4 chance of, of, of having an affected child in that situation. So we're talking about really, really, really tiny chances of, uh, if you're a carrier, and marrying a, uh, another carrier. It's, it's um, uh, unfortunately for those who do have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, it has happened to them. But um, uh, it's, uh, of all, I would say it, uh, th this could well be worth it when you're planning children to, to do have, have this type of testing to uh, at least know in advance what the risks are. To, to stay in the same uh, humorous vein as the question, I maintain that uh, alphas attract and that uh, uh, it may have to do with the fact that they're distant cousins and they see uh, things that they're familiar with in, in, their, in these uh, people. But, so uh, it may be tough to dilute out the uh, abnormal alpha-1 genes by planning uh, to marry only MM individuals. Okay. Um. Do most patients with alpha-1 get encouraged to take vitamin A or just eat healthy? And this person says to anyone. I, I have to answer that because this has been dogging me for most of my career. Early in my uh, work in alpha-1, um, when we were in the process of showing that alpha-1 antitrypsin is uh, inactivated by oxidation, primarily by exposure to cigarette smoke, and uh, some investigators at uh, uh, Albert Einstein in Philadelphia, not the one in New York, showed that you could reverse that oxidation and reconstitute uh, the potency of alpha-1 antitrypsin protein by exposing them to antioxidants. I was interviewed by, a, uh, uh, by Rodell Press, the people that publish um, a prevention magazine. Uh, and said that it would, might be a good idea for alphas to take uh, antioxidants and uh, came up with suggesting they take uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, and maybe even vitamin A because they had antioxidant properties and they probably wouldn't kill you uh, if you took them. Uh, and that quote has haunted me for the last several decades because Rodel Press recycles these um, uh, comments of mine over and over again in books and magazines is recommending antioxidants for people with COPD and especially alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So um, 
right now, I have to say, there's absolutely no evidence that um, things that are taken like uh, uh, like vitamins that happen to have antioxidant properties or other antioxidants, there's no evidence that clinically these actually have a beneficial effect in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Maybe some will come in the future that are potent enough to actually have uh, some demonstrated effects, but many companies have looked at uh, antioxidants as a potential uh, treatment for COPD and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in specific and have not been able to demonstrate a clinical benefit. Okay, thank you. When you have severely reduced diffusion capacity, is there anything that can be done to improve it? Dr. Chapman? Um. No, I'm not aware of anything that will improve your diffusion capacity um, short of lung transplant. So um, it's one of the reasons we are so anxious to um, begin augmentation therapy for people who need it, um, if it is available, if it is covered, um, because the goal of augmentation therapy is to preserve what you have. Uh, unfortunately, it does not help you to recover what you have lost. Great, I agree with that. Okay, um, in in some hospitals treating cancer in liver, they use laser type zapping successfully. Has this ever been done for a lung at this point? Do alpha patients have a higher occurrence of cancer? A double barrel question there. Can well, you wanna... one one of the advantages of uh, of liver cancer and alpha-1, the, the liver cancer that's associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a very specific cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and um, it is curable by uh, essentially lumpectomy, carving out the, uh, or, or eliminating the lobe of the liver by surgery uh, that has the, uh, uh, the cancer in it. Um, and so uh, as far as I know, I don't know of anyone that's looking to do some a different form of therapy um, since this form of therapy works well. And the, and the trick then is that you have to identify this cancer at its earliest possible, uh, at the earliest possible time. And that's why there's been a recommendation uh, that alpha-1 patients um, at risk of liver disease um, get ultrasounds every year or every other year um, because then you're likely to catch that. The other piece of good news besides the fact that catching it early catches it at a curable stage is that even though this uh, cancer risk is increased in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, it's still a very rare cancer. I mean, in the, in the 5,000 or so patients that AlphaNet follows in the United States, um, I could count on one hand over the last 15 years how many patients have developed uh, liver cancer. Um, and so it's a, uh, uh, the, the real treatment to prevent it is to prevent the liver disease, avoid fat, uh, uh, agents that might damage the liver and uh, get your liver uh, monitored carefully uh, what, uh, just because you have the diagnosis of alpha-1. Okay, here, here's a question about ACOS. How are doctors applying treatment with ACOS alpha patients as they age? Are most doctors familiar with the term ACOS now, or is it just airway specialists and respirologists? It would just be airway specialists and respirologists who are familiar with the term, who might be using the term, and I should add a word of caution that it's not a widely uh, agreed upon term. There are five or six definitions, as I think we talked about in the uh, presentation. So two doctors talking about ACOS may, in fact, be talking about different things. Family doctors are not yet too familiar with the term. Some of them will have heard of it, um, but uh, most will have not. And they're still struggling with the um, diagnosis of asthma and diagnosis of COPD using standard breathing tests, something they don't do enough of. As for what to do as patients get older, it's an interesting question. Um, we know that as patients with asthma get older, 
uh, their disease often becomes more constant, more stable. They may develop some persistent obstruction that won't go away, which sounds like a bad thing. On the other hand, it may also mean that the airway is less twitchy and doesn't narrow as dramatically as it once did. And it may be an opportunity to reduce medication. If that's true in ACOS, um, interesting speculation, don't know. Um, it may or may not be. And we're just now starting to look at the ACOS population of patients as a separate group that deserves its own uh, follow-up studies and its own specific form of treatment. Thank you. For Dr. Spivak, would every alpha patient be entitled to see a geneticist? Do all appointments have to be out of town, or can this be done through blood tests sent from a respirologist, and what would you want to know to get started? Okay, that's uh, there's a couple of answers to that question. Um, of course, uh, a uh, we can do the uh, genetic test uh, for any blood sample that we receive from a respirologist, um, any specialist that's do like to get as much information as possible um, to perform the analysis as, as accurately as we can. So having information like the enzyme activity that's been measured, what there's a, there's a family history, you know, get, getting the background. For, to see a geneticist, uh, there has to be a referral. Like for any specialist, you often have to get the referral from your, your uh, regular practitioner or your, your lung specialist. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are not enough genetic, uh, clinical geneticists in Canada, and there are a lot of genetic diseases. So often it means that you would have to wait several months for your appointment, unless there's an urgent, unless there's a real huge urgency that uh, may, makes it imperative, in which case they can bump, bump you up in, uh, and get you in uh, much more quickly. So um, genetic testing is, should be free in Canada through your, um, your, your provincial health plan, and um, as is genetic counseling is free too. Uh, I do believe that there is also some outreach clinics that it's possible to get a consultation uh, by telephone if you're in, say, northern Ontario or somewhere really where it's not possible to, um, to, to come in person. Um, and, but sometimes um, these pathways aren't well known by, um, by the local physician, say, in a small town. And, so it can be difficult, and I'm sure um, uh, your organization, Jim, can help people uh, in those situations. Yes, yeah, we definitely can. To get it. Okay, th this, this is a question from an email I mentioned. I'm going to try to shorten it up, but basically what the caller is, or the emailer is asking is, is there any connection between alpha-1 and hypoglycemia? She has... She's a ZZ, her sister's a ZZ, her other sister's an MZ, and they all have hypoglycemia too. Not that I'm aware of, unless there were some very significant liver disease. Even then, I think that would be unlikely. Okay, thank you. What is, sorry, I have to page down a bit. What is the daily protein intake requirement amount for men or women with alpha-1? I guess that would depend on a lot of other factors, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I, I don't carry the uh, nutritional um, recommendations around in my head, and you might talk to a dietitian, but as a, a quick ballpark answer, I would say if you are um, of normal weight, um, it would be the normal protein requirement of any individual. Um, you might have to bump up your protein intake um, and your general caloric intake if you've got fairly severe disease and you're starting to lose some weight, which we can see happen in fairly severe disease. Um, and that's when it's time to start thinking about frequent small meals, um, snacks like yogurt, cheeses, and so on. 
I know that isn't an exact grams per day answer, but the ballpark is normal weight, normal amounts. If you're losing weight, bump those amounts up. Thank you. Okay, this is a little bit long, but um, um, I have annual pulmonary function tests. My diffusion capacity is gradually decreasing. It has gone from 91 to 72 over the last five years. FEV1, however, is stable at 112. Would I ever qualify for augmentation therapy on the basis of decreasing diffusion capacity? This, I mean, the, the actual recommendations, I, I, I'm not sure that I know what the Canadian package insert says and if it's different uh, than the U.S. You, you could probably, I'll, I'll hand it over to Ken in a second, but I, I do want to say that we are um, questioning uh, whether we're giving, augment, we're starting augmentation therapy too late, in part thanks to the, uh, to the study that uh, uh, Ken was just the lead author on this, the rapid trial, there's certainly a suggestion, and it's logical, that if you're giving something that prevents lung destruction, that you would want to start that therapy in someone who's going to get lung destruction as early as possible. Um, the, the problem that we have is that there are some people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, even you know severe ZZ alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that will never get significant lung disease during the course of their lives, and you certainly wouldn't want to prescribe an expensive, you know, plasma-derived product for those people who might never need it. So one, one question that I would ask that questioner is, um, is there documentation that the, that the declining diffusing capacity represents pulmonary emphysema, and it, does it represent pulmonary emphysema that's getting worse? And if the answers to those two questions are yes, then it would probably be wise to discuss the possibility of augmentation therapy with the physician, although you'll get pushback from medical authorities because that's not the recommendation in the package insert and, the, and that the drug was approved based upon. And Ken can talk more specifically about uh, Canada. Yeah, I'd agree with what Sandy has said. I'll just um, add the Canadian product monograph, the um, instructions that the insurance companies and the provincial formularies would follow define the need for augmentation therapy um, on that old FEV1 number. As Andy said, um, that now may become outdated. We may want to look at other things, and I think the dropping diffusion capacity is quite rightly a concern to the questioner. Um, Sandy's alluded to perhaps evaluating more thoroughly for emphysema, and I'd agree, and I think a CT scan would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, but once uh, the evaluation has taken place, uh, it may indeed be a challenge to um, get the payer to uh, pay for augmentation therapy for somebody who's got a good FEV1, but other signs of emphysema. Um, but worth the fight. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, I'll ask this question, but I have a feeling uh, probably outside everybody's area, but anyway. That never stops us. I, I know that getting flu shots are recommended, but I have had Guillain-Barre syndrome, so don't get them as I fear worse paralysis. Can getting the shingles shot cause Guillain-Barre syndrome? I don't know what that last question, but no. last okay. part. <laughs> I guess we're both jumping in. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in influenza vaccination. I have lots of conversations with patients, and I think it's a good thing to do. But I'll pause and say the questioner has really named a very specific problem uh, that's immune in nature, and I gather from the question seem to follow a vaccination. Uh, this might be a time when I didn't push very hard for annual influenza vaccination. I understand the, uh, the questioner's reticence. Um, I would probably just redouble my other usual recommendations. Uh, watch out for those pesky grandchildren uh, harboring uh, the, the, the people who bring you viruses. And in season, make sure you're doing lots of hand washing and elbow bumping or fist bumping or whatever the handshaking substitute is. And 
you know, I'm, I don't know specifically about uh, the last part of that question, the shingles uh, uh, vaccine, uh, about whether there's been an association with uh, Guillain-Barre. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm doing right now is what any patient would do, which is looking up uh, uh, varicella zoster uh, and Guillain-Barre. Um, and basically everything I'm seeing is uh, wishy-washy. Basically, we can't rule out that this will be a problem, but we haven't seen it uh, kind of thing. So I think it's, this is something that's going to take a long discussion uh, and some research with your physician. And it's really going to come down to what risks you're willing to tolerate in order to prevent um, your, uh, yourself, to reduce your risk of any particular infection. Because even if you do get a vaccine, whether it's a vaccine against, uh, uh, against uh, shingles or a vaccine against the flu, as you well know, they are not 100% effective at preventing uh, these infections, and uh, so it's going to be a risk-benefit balancing act that you're going to have to be comfortable with as a patient, um, and uh, you're going to have to get all the information you can before making a decision like that. Okay, this is a rather long question, but I, I see what what the the patient or what the person is getting at. Basically, uh, you know how alphas with lung disease are supposed to get tests on a regular basis of their liver. Um, the the person is just asking, what, what are those tests, and if I don't have a, do I have to go to a hepatologist, or can my GP order them? I mean, your um, your GP should be able to order them. The usual thing that's recommended would be um, an ultrasound of the liver uh, has a baseline. Um, and some of the recommendations suggest periodically thereafter at intervals every two years, every five years. And um, uh, liver function tests, as they're called, which would be um, liver enzymes, it's just a blood test, very easy for the doctor to order. Um, there are other fancier tests that uh, liver specialists can order, but uh, by and large they're not part of routine. Just for a second. Okay, this one's for Dr. Sandhouse. In your presentation, you talked about mutations that might cause cancer happening when stem cells are grown up in a test tube. Mm -hmm. What about other mutations nobody ever thought of, good ones, good or bad? Well, we sort of addressed this uh, in, with an earlier question, but uh, the fact is that uh, uh, in one of the better articles about this, the one that I reviewed uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, where they actually, it actually was directly related to alpha-1. They took skin cells from a, a number of alpha-1 patients, took those skin cells, transformed them into stem cells, corrected the alpha-1 gene in those stem cells, then changed the, uh, uh, matured those stem cells into liver cells, um, with the goal in the future that those cells could then repopulate the liver of the person that donated their own cells to begin with, with liver cells that make normal alpha-1 antitrypsin. And they, as part of their work, first of all, they did not give those stem cells back to uh, the humans who had uh, been the, or the origin of those skin cells. They, they that was too risky a proposition to do at this point in time with our current knowledge, but instead injected those cells into the livers of, of mice that had been made tolerant uh, uh, by virtue of basically having a poor immune system um, and showed that those livers then were populated by those human cells and did make normal human alpha-1 antitrypsin. But one of the things that they did in detail in those studies was document the mutations that were accumulated in those stem cells while they were grown in culture with the goal of trying to uh, identify any mutations that might cause cancer. And when they didn't see those mutations, they went ahead and gave them to those mice. But they, while they could elucidate all the different mutations that they could identify, um, it's unclear what the, the functional differences were in those cells in terms of all the mutations that were uh, 
that were occurring, they were only looking to exclude mutations that were known to cause cancer. So that's a long way of saying that question's a great question, and we don't yet know what kind of effects those mutations might have uh, if this became a therapeutic um, in the future. But that's clearly one of the main questions that has to be answered in looking towards stem cell therapy. Now, having said that, we do stem cell therapy. We, meaning m modern medicine, uses stem cell therapy. They are, uh, uh, they do, they use stem cells derived from a patient's um, own bone marrow to replenish the bone marrow in someone that's uh, uh, getting a bone marrow transplant or something like that. Um, and those uh, stem cells have been grown briefly in culture, and there have been, uh, you know, th those therapies have been successful. And so clearly not every mutation that happens is bad, and uh, again, it's a risk-benefit analysis if you're trying to save someone's life that has a, uh, that has a uh, leukemia or a lymphoma or something like that by doing a bone marrow transplant, then uh, the, those risks for, of mutations pale in comparison to saving someone's life. But people have lived long and prospered um, with bone marrow transplantation of stem cells. How does the alpha patient know when to use both their antibiotic and prednisone? Are there particular standards one should watch for before using both? Ken, is it? I would, um, I'd review this with your doctor who's prescribed them, and I would say that often for milder disease, patients might take only an antibiotic. For more severe disease, patients would probably take both, and some patients may um, um, adjust this themselves. I've seen a lot of patients who will, if it seems to be a milder flare-up, just start with the antibiotic, but if it seems to be a more severe one, will um, um, take both drugs at once. Have a conversation with your doctor about that. This gets modified a bit if you have a strong asthmatic component, so coming back to that ACOS profile, in which case I would routinely use the prednisone as well. Thank you. Marcia, is, is M the only normal gene, or are there other normal genes, too? Oh, um, M just re represents um, the normal um, gene, Serpin A1, and there are various uh, versions of the M allele, so um, with minor, little minor differences that make no, uh, have no effect on the uh, on the actual protein um, that's created by that gene. So um, M is just a short form for normal. Um, I think originally when the first test was developed, the protein was run on a, on a gel and patterns would appear, and this is called isoelectric fo focusing. And, um, M meant middle, so the protein would run in the middle of the gel, and um, S ran slowly, and so it was called the S allele. I don't, I, I have no idea why Z is called Z, um, but I know that M is for middle and S is for slow, and uh, and as I said, there uh, there was no easy way to describe mutations in the early days. So it was pretty much uh, uh, whatever somebody wanted to call it. Um, and uh, so there's probably four or five M, M versions uh, that are all normal. You, you'll see this on, on reports of phenotypes, because you don't see it in the genotyping, because all of the M uh, proteins have the same amino acid structure the same and are the same uh, DNA uh, sequence uh, but you'll see on phenotyping where you actually look at the protein that they migrate a little differently in the, and there you, you will see on a phenotype report that it might say M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6 
um, those are those uh, slight differences. But we know that there are hundreds of mutations that have been identified so far, and only a small fraction of those, maybe a third of them, are associated with a deficiency or a dysfunctional alpha-1 protein. So there must be many other mutations, many mutations that, as far as we can tell, still lead to normal functioning of the alpha-1 gene. It may not be that we're looking at every single function of alpha-1, um, but in the, in the broad way that we look at alpha-1 functioning as an elastase inhibitor, there are a lot of mutations that don't seem to affect the, the ability of, of alpha-1 to inhibit neutrophil elastase. Um, and so whether you call those normal or not is kind of open to question. They're still mutations. They just aren't necessarily mutations that change the function of alpha-1 antitrypsin the way we look at alpha-1 antitrypsin. Yeah, I agree. Um, there are M1, M2, M3, M4, but uh, yeah, there are probably dozens and dozens of unnamed M, M alleles that are absolutely normal. And, and we do sometimes detect those when we do the gene sequencing and we um, pair that result with, say, the patient's enzyme activity, and we can, we can generally say, well, the enzyme activity is completely normal. We found this variant that's maybe unique in this person or their family, um, and, but we would still, because of the lack of any uh, apparent harm, we, might, we would probably say it's probably harmless or benign. Okay, thank you. Okay, it looks like we're almost, or I guess we are at 8 o'clock, so I've got one more question here, and it's meant for Ken. Um, should, a should a sputum lab test be done every time a patient has increased prolonged, uh, an, an increased prolonged sputum episode, or is there an accepted annual test that should be done to be vigilant? I think this is something that um, doctors should do occasionally under some circumstances. It's not something that needs to be done routinely, annually, for example, and it doesn't have to be done for every flare-up. But um, we do know that some people have lots of flare-ups, a pattern of frequent flare-ups, and in those circumstances, absolutely, one should um, get a sample of that sputum. It should go to a lab. And I add most doctors who aren't specialists, and even many of the specialists, will just test for the common bacteria. Um, it's worth testing some of the less common bacteria. And there's um, a whole family of germs that are a little bit like tuberculosis. They're called mycobacteria. Doctors, uh, for quirky reasons, call them AFB for acid fast bacilli. And those should be looked for in patients with COPD and in particular patients with alpha, this um, type of infection may be a little bit more common in our alpha patients. It's commonly overlooked um, and it, uh, it may be a very important issue to find. It um, does require some very specific and very different treatment. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Okay, well, um, that's going to end our Q&A session here today. Uh, on behalf of Alpha One Canada, I certainly want to say a big thank you to our panelists, Dr. Ken Chapman, Dr. Marcia Spivak, and Dr. Robert Sander, or Sandy Sandoz, for taking the time to answer our questions um, uh, tonight. I'm sure we learned a lot. I, I know I certainly did. If you haven't already done so, please visit our website to view the other videos uh, in the series. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. And if you haven't watched Dr. Chapman's, Dr. Spivak's, or Dr. Sandhouse videos, I highly recommend them as well. Uh, finally, I'm excited to let attendees know that our next Q&A webinar with guest speakers will be in September. Be sure to check your emails for details, such as speaker and exact time. So once again, thank you everyone. Uh, have a great night, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.